Thank you for joining us at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences here at Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, today, we're going to gain some insights about aging uh, from the pediatric illness, progeria, which we'll be hearing about in a moment. But first, uh, let me introduce uh, Anahita Mojiri. Uh, Dr. Mojiri is a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration. She'll be talking to us a little bit later about her exciting work uh, with uh, progeria cells derived from the children with progeria. And we have a very special guest uh, today, uh, Dr. Leslie Gordon. Uh, Professor Gordon, welcome to our cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you. And let me just uh, introduce you to the audience. Um, Dr. Gordon is a professor at Brown. Uh, she uh, does pediatric research there. Uh, she also has an appointment at uh, Harvard and uh, at Boston Children's Hospital. She is a guru of uh, this illness that's called progeria and uh, is co-founder of the Progeria Research Foundation, uh, which foundation has held 10 NIH-funded international meetings on progeria uh, annually. And we uh, just had one recently. We're going to be hearing about that in a minute from Dr. Gordon. Dr. Gordon really has spurred the research in this area. Um, in 2003, she was on the paper that described the alteration, the mutation in uh, the de genetic disorder that uh, causes this disease. And uh, she's, been, uh, she's spurred clinical trials for the treatment of this disorder. Uh, so we'll be hearing about that in a moment. Uh, she got her MD and PhD degrees at Brown, uh, where she is a professor of uh, pediatrics. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Leslie. We just had a meeting, um, uh, your meeting at the Progeria Research Foundation, the 10th international meeting on progeria. Are we going to hear a little bit about that today? Well, we, I, I'd be glad in the end. I'll tell you a little bit about sort of future, the future of where the research is going, where we, we hope that the treatments and cure are coming from, and sort of uh, that's the nature of these international scientific meetings is the cutting edge and where we're going to be going to find treatments and the cure for the children with progeria. What brought you to starting the Progeria Research Foundation? Well, our, our son Sam was diagnosed with progeria at the age of almost two, and um, that was 1998. And back then, it was a lot different than today, although you can sort of imagine for a very, very ultra-rare disease, which I'll tell you about the um, in a few moments, I'm going to talk about what progeria is. Uh, for a rare disease like progeria, there was nothing available. And like many parents uh, of rare children with rare diseases, we started a foundation. But we, my husband and I happened to have MDs and PhDs and also had the capacity to think of this from a research perspective and how to jumpstart the research. And that was our goal. It's a spectacular story. Uh, you've done so much, and you've won a number of awards for the work that you've done. The March of Dimes, Basil O'Connor Award, the uh, American Heart Association uh, Scientist Development Award, uh, the Gerontological Society of America Award for Contributions to Progeria, uh, NIH Bench to Bedside Grant, and uh, an award I'll never get, uh, the Mother of Year Award <laughs> from <laughs> Working Mother Magazine. Congratulations. <laughs> such, such, such fine work that we're going to be hearing about today. Thank you. Oh, well, John, you've been a wonderful colleague, and I so appreciate your and your lab's work on progeria. It's very exciting, and it's very important. Thank you. Well, maybe we should go to your presentation. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, now let me do this properly. Uh, Well, oh, here we go. Okay. All righty. Are you seeing that? Yes. Looks good. Okay, fantastic. What I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so, I won't keep you too long, um, I know you have a lot to talk about today, is talk about 
insights into aging from progeria um, and other aspects of progeria by sort of telling a story. Um, my disclosures are here. And as you were asking me about, this is Sam. In 1998, Sam was diagnosed with progeria at the age of almost two. I had never heard about progeria even in medical school, and neither had my husband. That's how rare it is. Um, and so at the time, there was really no hope. I mean, I, I, I stopped what I was doing uh, cold like any parent would and tried to learn what's out there. Where do we have to go? What will help? And there were less than a handful full of scientists working in the field. There was no research funding. We didn't really know if this was a genetic disease. And we didn't really know if there was, this was a disease actually related to aging. Um, therefore, we said, OK, that's it. We're starting this foundation. And my husband and I, along with colleagues, friends, family, started a foundation called the Progeria Research Foundation to find the cause, treatment, and cure for a progeria. What I'd like to do today is to show you lots of great photos of kids with progeria because they're amazing and beautiful and wonderful. But I also want to teach you about the disease phenotype. What does it look like? What is the biology and the genetics of progeria? And key aspects of things about progeria that overlap with aging and some things that don't. And this is why it's called the segmental premature aging disease. Each field can learn from the other. I want to tell you about the programs and collaborations that we've formed for success throughout the years and that will jettison us uh, to our success in the future with finding the cure. Um, and so I'll talk about discoveries that have led to the clinical treatment trials for this very rare disease. And I'll talk about things that are on the cutting edge, things that are coming up that we hope and we can see a pathway for new treatments and new clinical trials. This is progeria. It is, as I told you, a segmental premature aging disease. And it's our responsibility to find out and explore the things that overlap with aging, the things that don't from not only a clinical but a biological level, so that we can pull from each of these fields to inform us better and help us to go farther faster. The prevalence of progeria is only one in 20 million living individuals. And that means that today in the entire world, there are about 400 children living with progeria. And some are young adults now. And I'll tell you a little bit about that too, as we move into talking about um, uh, the treatment that we've been working with in the clinic for quite some time. This we know now is an autosomal dominant disease. It's not passed down in families. And the Un, without any treatment, meaning a treatment that affects progeria uh, and progerin, which causes progeria, the, the average lifespan is 14 and a half years. The children die of um, severe cardiovascular, premature, and accelerated cardiovascular disease. And this is a child, her name is Rachel, and this is when she was born, and this is as she grew in, and this is her at the age of nine. So what do we know about the clinical disease? Well, as I said, some things look like aging and th some things look a little bit different. Um, children with progeria lose all of their hair, develop an alopecia and a severe global lipodystrophy. They lose their subcutaneous body fat and therefore this little girl looks very muscular. This disease um, promotes growth, severe growth failure. So the children are born uh, at at uh, the appropriate uh, size, but fall off their growth curves and uh, very quickly, and then um, end up at a, a maximum of about uh, maybe 20 kilos at most, even in their teens and early 20s. There are joint contractures, as you see here. There is a nail dystrophy. This is joint contractures. You can see a lot of, a lot of the features here. There are bony effects on the hip and other bones in progeria and skin effect. But the, uh, perhaps the most important effects are in the cardiovascular system. And in fact, this is where the children with progeria look most like aging. The children suffer from strokes, as you can see in this MRI here. And they get a severe premature atherosclerosis. What you're seeing here is a nice uh, pathway of blood flow to the brain in the carotid artery, 
But on the other side, what you're seeing on the right side is a complete block. And the children get very stiff vasculature. They get plaques in their vascular. They get calcifications. They eventually develop heart failure. And so if we can learn from the aging field and the aging field can learn from the field of progeria, maybe we can understand and combat this cardiovascular disease. We say it all starts with the children because the programs we built from uh, at the Progeria Research Foundation really do have the child in mind and how we can help best to promote the research. We have an international progeria registry. And now we're able to have, since we discovered the gene mutation in 2003, a diagnostics program. But we also have a cell and tissue bank, medical and research database. And I'll go into those a little bit, all these to foster clinical trials. We now today know of 126 children with progeria. That means identified by the Progeria Research Foundation in our international progeria uh, registry. 126 of the 400 are known to us from 54 different, pardon me, 54 different countries, as you see here. We're always searching for more because in order to help the children, you need to find the children. Our cell and tissue bank has supplied cells uh, and tissues to uh, 181 research teams in an effort to promote basic science and preclinical research. Lots of grant funding. We give, we're a small organization, but we try to boost as much as we can um, by giving grants to now over uh, 70 grants have been given to researchers in 40 different countries. And this is meant to just give people a start with their novel ideas. And all of this together has promoted uh, scientific publications, which we think is an indication of incredible progress in the field, things that can lead to, to clinical progress as well in understanding both progeria and aging. So this is where we started with nothing per year, basically a few kind of clinical cases, and this is where we are um, today, way up here. We also use our knowledge, our new knowledge of what was something that physicians just never never had almost never had an experience with and when we ha they had a child with progeria um, in their clinic they didn't know what to do we have a, a full clinical handbook it's over 100 pages and that's because we've learned so much over the years about how to help children to have a better quality of life now jump start uh, this research uh, we, we started in 1998 but in 2003 actually 2002 the we formed a genetics consortium uh, that was about 20 members uh, 20 people who are who were dedicated to asking what is the gene mutation for progeria and we were able to do that um, taking the lead from our uh, Francis Collins Francis Collins the current director of the National Institutes of Health led the way this was the, at the same time he was uh, sequencing the human genome. He was also um, helping us to look for the gene mutation responsible for progeria. And this really catapulted us into a new phase when we discovered the lamin-A mutation uh, that causes progeria. Now, lamin-A is um, an internuclear membrane protein. This is the gene that has a mutation that causes progeria. It has a lot of functions. It has both structural and cell signaling effects. It's expressed mostly in differentiated cell types. And um, what I'm showing you here is the mutation itself. So I'm just showing you a sequence. And there essentially is a, a change from a C to a T. Here, a single base change in the lamin-A gene produces what's called a silent mutation, but activates an internal splice site so that suddenly you end up with a protein that is recognized by the spliceosome and it's shorter. It's 50 amino acids shorter than the normal lamin A protein. And it's called progerin. And it's sort of a lamin A imposter that is responsible for all of disease and the damage in progeria. So what you're seeing here is a Western blot with mom and dad not having this band, not having lamin normal lamin A and lamin C but the child HG has this band called progerin. So now we knew what we were looking at. We could see our enemy. We could produce mouse models uh, for testing drugs and other things. Um, and we could understand that 
uh, by understanding more about laminae, we could understand more about this toxic protein and how to combat it. So I'm going to shift now a little bit to aging because I can tell you that I never was convinced. I said, I, I need to see the scientific data that says aging and progeria just, just don't happenstance look like each other. Um, what does aging and progeria have to do with each other at the biological and cellular level? And so we started looking for progerin that once we identified this brand new abnormal protein in aging individuals. And Karima Jabali's work is seen here where she takes forehead biopsies. If you take forehead biopsies, she created a beautiful anti-progerin anti antibody that's specific for progerin. And what you're seeing here, every red dot is a single cell on the forehead of a 93-year-old um, that is progerin positive. That these are single cells. If you do this same thing with a six-year-old, you see nothing. So progerin is in all of us. And then this study we did and looked for progerin in vasculature of aging individuals. So you'll see age here on the x-axis, on the y-axis, how much progerin is present. We've got the, uh, the vascular adventitia, media, and in plaque. And uh, there is an increase um, of about 3% per year of progerin. And that sort of leaves us with having about 100-fold less progerin in us. But it's here, and it probably contributes to aging in the vasculature and the skin. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what has led us to potential treatments um, and clinical trials for progeria. What you're seeing here on the left is post-translational processing of the normal laminae, and on the right, post-translational abnormal processing of progerin. What I'm going to point out here is the very first step, is that the pre-laminae becomes farnesylated. A group is added here onto the end that is lipid-loving. It's called a farnesyl group, and it's added by this enzyme. And it allows this protein to associate with the internuclear membrane. And in fact, um, farnesyl groups are used by hundreds of proteins in the body to do just this same thing so that their proteins can associate with membranes and work better and, and function. Well, progerin is also farnesylated, but it's permanently farnesylated. And this allows it to intercalate into nuclear membranes and do their damage a very long term. So we thought that perhaps there was a, that, that we could combat uh, progerin somewhat at this level there were drugs being developed for actually cancers that were susceptible and farnes uh, like RAS, which is farnesylated. Cancers um, some are sometimes farnesylated and farnesyl transferase inhibitors were being developed for cancers. And so we repurposed those and asked whether farnesyl FTIs, farnesyl transferase inhibitors, like the one I'm showing here called lonafarnib, could be used for progeria. And we quickly found that um, this, and this is where we started. We also, so this was our first clinical trial using farnesyl transferase inhibitors. And I'm going to just briefly tell you that we've had several clinical trials um, testing other things like statins and bisphosphonates because they feed into the actual production of farnesyl groups. And currently, we're also looking at a drug called Everolimus, which works at a different level at potentially disposing of um, at the autophagy level, promoting the elimination of progerin. So these are the three, whoops, these are the levels upon where, we, where so far we've worked to ask questions. So ever, the Everolimus trial is ongoing. We don't know the results. I'm going to show you the results of the Lonafarnib trial. And I can tell you that the triple therapy trial, Lonafarnib, Pravastatin, and Zoledronate, yielded similar results to the Lonafarnib trial, so we don't recommend the addition of those two drugs. At the basic science level, farnesyl transferase inhibitors caused normalization of the abnormal shapes in the nuclei of progeria cells. That's sort of the hallmark of the abnormality. They caused, imp uh, uh, it ca they caused improvement in modest improvement, but this was, the remember, the first time we were seeing any type of improvement in lifespan of progeria mice. And what you're seeing at the bottom is the integrity of the progeria mouse vasculature. This is a wild type, C57 black mouse. 
this is a mouse, that the vascular wall of a mouse that is untreated and we add Farnesyl transferase inhibitor and we get a healthier looking vasculature. And then we said, okay, we have enough to move into clinical trial and repurpose this drug. And we started these trials at Boston Children's Hospital and we brought the children in to the single site from all over the world and we brought them in in pairs. And this was in, started in 2007. We brought them in in pairs because these weeks were difficult, head to toe examinations, poking and prodding, and they, are, they and their families were there to support each other and it really worked out well. What did we find in these clinical trials, which uh, took place over a period of over 10 years, actually, uh, one trial or another? We found that on the drug lonafarnib, weight gain was very, very modestly improved, but statistically significant, but very modest. The kids still looked and at the, they were about the size of other kids with progeria still. But importantly, we found improvements in what we call cardiovascular stiffness. So the walls of the vessels of these children are more like 50 and 60 year olds than they are of five, six and 10 year olds. And we used a test called the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity to ask whether Lonafarnib was able to relieve that problem. And it was, and it was dramatic. We also had improvement in bone structure. But some of the systems were not affected. Systems that could be very important. The children still had a, a lipodystrophy, their joints, their hair, their dental, some of the th features of progeria um, were not affected by the medication. And so what I'd like to stress is that we were, we, the best thing about the Lonafarnib trials is that we've realized that we can push this disease towards health and we now know we've got to push farther. Now, what else did we find? We found something incredibly important, which is that Lonafarnib is able to increase the lifespans of, as a group, the children with progeria. So what you're looking at here is a study where this is time since start of treatment, and this is probability of survival. We've got a control group in blue. These are children that lived at the same time as the children on trial. Now the trials were open label. So this is a concurrent external control group where the children were living at the same time and they're paired with the children who are on medication. And each time you drop, you've lost a child. So in the control group that did not receive lonafarnib, we had nine deaths. And in the lonafarnib group, we had one death after about four months of treatment. And so this was dramatic, a, a highly reduced risk of, uh, of, of passing away on lonafarnib. And so very, very exciting to us. And we've moved um, in, in partnership with a, a drug company called Iger Biopharmaceuticals to applying for FDA approval for Lonafarnib. And we, cross your fingers, um, we have a date for that decision, which is actually very soon, November 20th. So we're hoping to have our first approved drug in just a few weeks. But again, I want to stress that what we've found here does, is a treatment. It's not a cure but we know we can move this disease towards health. Now, you know, we were enrolling children that were eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 years old, and we're able to actually improve their disease. So children are more resilient than we think. We didn't have to catch it at age one or two, we could still make a difference. And as John was saying, um, we, uh, we have uh, meetings every two years, we have an international uh, scientific workshop and we weren't able to have it in person. So we made this big decision to have the meeting by webinar, by Zoom. And I think it was a smashing success. I got a lot of really nice um, feedback. We started out with these two patient families telling about their experiences. One of the families from, uh, one of the families, this is uh, Sammy and he's 25 years old and he's been on Lonafarnib since 2007. And that this, this other family, the family of Alexandra, who just was diagnosed a couple of years ago, they told us about their experiences, about having a place to go like this foundation and knowing that scientists and researchers are on their side. Very, very important. Okay, so what's next? Um, in the workshop, uh, John asked me to give just a little bit of a, um, a workshop how-to, what, what did we discover? 
what we're really looking at here is um, lots of projects, uh, lots of proof of principle, but what comes to the surface are some of these studies that are very, very successful in at least um, you know, looking at the mouse models, which we transfer that into the, into the ch children. So we've got some small molecules that are promising, that interact in different ways. Some interact with progerin at the nuclear membrane. Others uh, are looking at imp inflammation, for example. Uh, and so coming at the protein level from different directions could provide for combination therapy that's successful. Another very, very exciting area that I really think could come quickly, and I think um, John is going to tell us more about um, your research in this arena, is RNA therapeutics or morpholinos, where we can actually alter the RNA, at the, at the RNA level, alter how much progerin is translated into um, the protein, is, is actually translated. And so that would be incredible. Um, an incredible way to affect disease if we can get these medications into the body, into the vasculature, which in the mice we can do. Um, DNA-based editing, all of us are excited about CRISPR-Cas technology, and we do have a proof of principle and very successful uh, mouse studies showing that if you base edit the progerin mutation itself, you can get tremendous effect and uh, in the mouse models over 200% extension in lifespan. And now we need to figure out how to deliver that effectively into the children. So where are we now? Uh, we're on the cutting edge, we're zooming along. We always wish it could go much, much faster. The Lonafarnib is our first medicine. It's available right now through trials and a managed access program, but hopefully soon will be available by prescription. But we're far from finished. The children, are, we're learning from adult literature. Um, we're learning about aging from the children with progeria, but we also need to forge ahead with intensity, with collaborations and with scientists like, um, like those found in your organization. So thank you. I always have to end by showing a picture of my guys as my husband and my, my son, Sam, when he got his Eagle Scout badge. Thank you um, for everything. Thank you for inviting me, but more than that, thank you for, for, for caring so much about these children and doing such fine, fine work. Dr. Gordon, thank you so much. That was just a spectacular. And congratulations on the wonderful work you've done uh, from bench to bedside, from understanding the underlying cause of this condition, uh, all the way to creating animal models that we as scientists can use in our research to clinical trials, and, and now a drug that uh, looks to be effective for progeria. Uh, just amazing progress. Thank you. We do have a question from, one question from the audience, and that is how early can progeria be detected? When is the usual, when, when does it get detected, and is it possible to detect it earlier? Oh my gosh, that's, the, that's, that's a, that's a million-dollar question. It's a wonderful question because actually progeria is a genetic disease. It could be um, in, in a panel. If, if every baby got a whole exome sequence, uh, then we would be able to detect it right away. But because it's so very rare, we don't usually test for it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, some of the children, you, you can see some skin signs in some of the children pretty fast, almost at birth. And so a really good pediatrician or dermatologist, especially somebody who has been exposed to progeria, that's a big goal, right? The more you see, the more you can tell. Somebody who's, who's heard about it before says, something's nagging me, um, and, and is able to identify this, sometimes very, very early. The kids don't usually start losing their hair enough, and the lipodystrophy takes maybe six months, maybe longer. So a lot of kids don't get diagnosed till they're a little bit older, maybe a year, maybe two years. But if you look back, and some people do, some like especially dermatologists are really good at this. If you look back, sometimes you can catch it pretty, pretty, very early. Well, thanks for that. Um, the um, the other thing I learned at your meeting, I thought was, was very important, and you mentioned it today, is that uh, progerin accumulates in all of us. So the, the findings from your work, the findings from the clinical trials may uh, apply to, to all of us. Uh, what, yeah, yeah, what, tell us a little bit more about that, how uh, progeria may apply to normal aging. 
Well, progerin, progerin is toxic. Progerin is something that it, when it accumulates, it's, it's, it's affecting the cells that it's in. It's just affecting your, the, the cells around it. Um, there, it promotes sort of a cell death and an extracellular matrix collection. And remember, we, we sort of all get stiffer vessels as we age, and these kids are just getting it much, much faster. So it, it, we, can't for, we can't say that there's definitive evidence that progerin causes um, the atherosclerosis of aging. But I think we deserve, we deserve research that really digs into the presence of progerin in the organs of us of all of us as we age, especially the cardiovascular system, and what that means to cardiovascular disease, such as atherosclerosis, or even just stiffer vessels as we age. Well, a lot because more to do. Would, yeah, and remember, having, having a tighter vessel means you have to get blood through that vessel. You have to get the same amount of blood through that vessel, but it's tighter, so it's going to put pressure on the heart, and the heart's going to suffer for that vascular tightness. That's right. Well, um, you know, just on that, on that theme, um, we, have, uh, we have an interest in vascular biology and vascular aging here. And uh, I think maybe we can um, go to the next set of slides and, and show, um, show the audience and Dr. Gordon what we've been doing uh, with the progeria cells that we've got from your organization. So the Progeria Research Foundation provides uh, cells for us, uh, cells for people all around the country, scientists from all around the country that want to work on progeria. And uh, thank you for making that available to us because we found some really interesting things that we'd like to show you today. And as you were saying, uh, Dr. Gordon, the, the problem for these children uh, that ultimately re results in their mortality is the vascular disease. And and shown here are, is your work, really. Uh, I think this was published in Circulation and some time ago, 2003 maybe, um, yeah. Uh, your work showing that uh, the coronary arteries are narrowed in these children and um, many of them die from a heart attack. Th these, uh, for, for me as a vascular biologist and vascular medicine doctor, these look like uh, vessels from a very old individual. That, that is not healthy. Um, and uh, so we're, we're interested in the disease coming from that angle of vascular biology. So let me. Let me go to the uh, next slide here. There we go. So, whoops. Let's go back. So, one of the determinants of aging, one of the determinants of aging is the telomere, telomere erosion. So, uh, as you know, telomeres are the, the tips of the chromosomes. You, they're, they're important for protecting the chromatin, for protecting the DNA. And uh, at, with division of cells, there's a loss of the telomere. Except in stem cells. Stem cells have an enzyme called telomerase that can re-extend the telomere. That's why they're stem cells. They can replicate indefinitely. At least the embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells can replicate indefinitely uh, because of that property of having that telomerase enzyme. Now, the other thing we know is that the telomere becomes shorter with aging, and uh, it is shorter still in our patients with diabetes with uh, major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So individuals that have risk factors for cardiovascular disease or that have uh, cardiovascular disease are more likely to have shorter telomeres, and short telomeres are predictive of major adverse cardiovascular events, death uh, from heart attack and stroke. So um, we did some work with the progeria cells that your organization gave to us. Um, and uh, what we found is, is not too surprising. And we, we found in the fibroblasts, it's been shown by others, that the uh, fibroblasts from the, the children with progeria uh, have increased levels of the senescence marker, um, beta-galactosidase. And um, what we wanted to see is if we could improve the proliferation of these cells with uh, telomerase by extending the telomere. Now, what I'm highlighting here is the cell growth of, of fibroblasts from these children. Uh, the, the cells grow very poorly, just like the children. And uh, at some point, they just poop out. They die. And, uh, but if we treat them with uh, telomerase to extend the telomere, we can get um, a marked improvement in their proliferation. 
Um, and we were able to compare this to Lana Farnab. And um, Lana Farnab uh, did, had some benefit in terms of reducing the senescence marker, but uh, telomerase, at least in our hands, was even better. Um, so that was exciting. Anyway, th those aren't vascular cells, though. Fibroblasts are, are, are a component of the vessel wall, but the endothelium is what is very important for maintaining vascular health. So we were interested to, to see uh, what the benefit would be of telomerase in the uh, vascular cells from these children. So how do you get vascular cells from, from a person? Um, I guess you can, you can do biopsies, but that's kind of difficult. Uh, you can, uh, and, and it, it has been done, but you're making iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, Anahita. Dr. Mojiri is making these induced pluripotent stem cells from the fibroblasts, and um, we've got these also from the, the Progeria Research Foundation, the iPSCs, and you've been able to differentiate those into vascular cells so that we can study vascular aging yes. uh, using these, these cells. Tell us a little bit about that work. Uh, as you mentioned, it's very difficult to have uh, endothelial cells from these children to do more study uh, and understanding the mechanism or improve their lives. So here, as you see, the, um, we have the iPSCs from these children. And so uh, during the course of two weeks, and different uh, growth factors, uh, we can change these iPSCs to become endothelial cells. And at 12 days, we actually facts sort them to have a pure endothelial cells. And you see, interestingly, so these uh, pictures are uh, stages of iPSCs to become endothelial cells. We have a good purity of the cells, and you see here, actually the colony of stem cells in both progeria and the control, they are quite the same. You can't differentiate them. However, when you differentiate them to endothelial cells, you can see even their morphology is quite obvious that they are different. Uh, the endothelial cells in the control, they are uh, nicely growing, they are proliferating, and they can make a contact. But in the and the telial cells of the progeria, you see that they are rounder, they are bigger, and they can't grow as good. So we, ha we were able to have uh, enough endothelial cells from the control, uh, their parents with, which have a similar background, and uh, also the patient, and then we studied them after. So. And I guess it's worth, worth saying that we, we studied the endothelial cells as well as the vascular smooth muscle cells. And, and I, coming from our standpoint as, uh, as a vascular biologist, we think the endothelial cells play as an important role, if more, not more important, uh, in vascular disease, um, at least in humans. That's uh, so true. that's why we're kind of focusing on, on the endothelial cells. But you also have some data with vascular smooth muscle yes. cells that's similar. Yes. And, uh, and here, as you can see, so the idea was because in these children we have a short telomere, uh, what if we use the RNA from telomerase, the enzyme that you mentioned, it could extend the telomere of the cells and um, perhaps we could reverse the aging process in the cells. And that's why we used that mRNA in the cells. And for first, we measured the telomere extension to understand the therapy on the cells was successful uh, or not. So here, at the left, you see the spread uh, picture of the chromosome, each chromosome, and I don't know if This is a metaphase spread. It's difficult to see on this slide. But yes. You're, you're trying to quantify the exactly. telomere length. Exactly. So telomere at the, each end of the chromosome, they are different color, and you can uh, measure the intensity of that color in each chromosome. Mm -hmm. And as you see here in the first chart, the redis progeria, if you compare the intensity of the telomere um, to the black, which is a control, you see the intensity is lower, which means they have a very short telomeres. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, though, after the treatment of, uh, with the RNA uh, of telomerase, the telomeres extension uh, happens, and now we see we have a nice longer telomere, which is equal to the control. Mm -hmm. So at least we were able to extend the telomere toward the control. And the next one you see nicely that um, 
while the progeria cells proliferate very poorly, as you mentioned earlier, in compared to the black controlled parents, but after treatment, the blue is uh, when you treat these cells with the telomerase, mm -hmm. and now they start growing almost equal to the control. So it seems that the treatment uh, of these progeria endothelial cells with the telomerase mRNA could uh, rescue their proliferation and uh, um, it, ca it, it actually extends the telomer uh, for these cells that uh, could help with other process of the cells. And I guess it's worth pointing out that the RNA telomerase itself doesn't last very long in the cell, just a few hours. The protein may last for days, maybe up to 72 hours, uh, but then it's gone. So the cells are not immortalized, but uh, their proliferation is improved. They've got an extra lifespan. We've been able to increase the lifespan of these human cells, right? That is true, which is the advantage of, of these uh, RNA therapy mm -hmm. because you don't want to manipulate the uh, genome. You mm -hmm. want something that could uh, go there and affect properly, and then cells would get rid of that. And that's why it's very, I believe, it's uh, one of the advantages of uh, mRNA therapy. So, and uh, here, um, I can't. Let me click it again. That's okay. You can go ahead. Okay. Away. So, well, um, because it is published that uh, when cells are aged, they're not only um, uh, having the inflammation, DNA damage, and all these problems uh, with the aged cells, but also they are, they are um, releasing. Uh, cytokines and uh, um, proteins that could affect the neighboring cells. Mm. So to understand that, what happens when endothelial cells are sick, what happens to the neighboring cells, which is vascular mm. small muscle cells. So I tried to design an experiment which uh, I had a, a monolayer of vascular small muscle cells, and I could add the conditioned media. From so these are normal vascular smooth muscle cells, and you wanted to see what adverse effect the endothelial cells could have on those underlying vascular smooth muscle That's cells. That's true. So we had these cells, and then we had a just fresh growth media, and then we had the conditioned media from the control endothelial cells, and conditioned media from the progeria endothelial cells, and also conditioned media from the progeria endothelial cells that have been treated with telomerase. So when we put these conditioned media on the vascular smooth muscle cells, as you see here, so uh, in the fresh media uh, cells in green are growing, the proliferation rate is similar to when you added the conditioned media uh, to the vascular smooth muscle cells. From normal cells. From normal cells. However, in the red, you see the normal vascular smooth muscle cells have been exposed to the conditioned media from progeria endothelial cells. Mm -hmm. They can't grow. They, they, they uh, clearly showing the reduction of proliferation in these cells. Interestingly enough, that if you add the conditioned media from uh, endothelial cells, progeria endothelial cells that have been treated, and then you put it in the vascular smooth muscle cells, you see that they are growing normal. Okay. And that is interesting because it seems that if you uh, rescue the endothelial cells, they could send the good signals mm -hmm. to the neighboring cells. So progeria endothelial cells are senescent. They're making senescence factors, like inflammatory cytokines. They're making the underlying vascular smooth muscle cells sick. That could be reversed by treating the endothelial cells with HTER, with That's human telomerase. Yes, and at the right, you see, we looked at actually 48 uh, uh, pro-inflammatory markers, and the first column at the left, you see, this is the heat map of expression of proteins that uh, uh, are released in the media. So the left one is the control. And the middle one is the progeria. You see it all become red. It means that lots of inflammatory markers are released. And then uh, they're all vascular smooth muscle cells. And then uh, you see in the last one, the vascular smooth muscle cells that have been exposed to the uh, condition media from treated endothelial cells now goes back to the normal. They behave normally. So we could reduce the um, let's say, side effect of these mm -hmm. abnormal endothelial mm -hmm. cells in the vascular smooth muscle cells. I okay. 
Um, okay, let's go back. So, we we tried our therapy actually in the mice model of the progeria, and um, we this time just to prove a principle of what telomerase could do for these mice. We started injection of the lentiviral, which carry uh, mouse telomerase in these mice. Um, and we started at three months. And we observed, it was interesting to see in the aorta uh, endothelial cells, um, we could reduce the expression of the progerin. And also in the, I'll show you the graph, in the aorta endothelial cells, we were able to reduce the progerin. In the lung endothelial cells, we were also able to reduce the progerin. And that looks like you're missing some, some uh, yeah, histology the there, but you showed nicely that uh, this inflammatory marker in the endothelial cells of the progeria mouse, um, the, that inflammatory marker was increased in the aorta of the mice, and that with the telomerase treatment, that was reduced. So the, the, what you're observing in the human uh, cells, the human progeria cells, is, is similar to what you're seeing now in the progeria mouse model. Exactly, exactly. And what's interesting to see, perhaps reduction of the toxicity of the progeny in these mice, we observed that uh, the, they, we could extend their lifespan to 20%, which was uh, uh, just by um, providing the telomerase therapy for these mice, which was very interesting to see that. Uh, and one of the biggest effects that we see on the pathology was reduction of the DNA damage in the liver, in the aorta, and in the lung endothelial cells. So these results suggest uh, some potential for uh, telomerase to be used as a therapy, especially as a uh, RNA therapy, yeah. which has the minimum side effect, I would say, for the cells. I know you have, you have a lot of data that you haven't had a chance to show us, and, and some of the slides didn't quite come through, but, but uh, we can talk through it a little bit with uh, Leslie. Why don't we do that? Why don't we talk a little bit uh, about uh, your findings with Dr. Gordon? So um, uh, to summarize, uh, you found that uh, treatment of um, human progeria cells uh, in vitro with RNA telomerase can uh, extend the telomere, can restore replicative capacity, and um, also improve a lot of functions, uh, which we didn't have time to go through, the ability for the endothelial cells to form tubes, angiogenesis, et cetera. And they release a lot of inflammatory cytokines, the progeria endothelial cells, and treatment with telomerase reduces that. And now you're finding some very similar things with uh, telomerase treatment in the mouse progeria model that we now have as a result of Francis Collins' work with, with Dr. Gordon. So, um, Leslie, any comments about that? Oh, it's wonderful work. Thank you so much for showing it. I know you have a lot more uh, that you don't have time to show, but it's, it's really beautiful work. You've covered your, your, your cellular um, studies and your mouse studies, um, and it's, it's a really exciting proof of principle. Can I ask, um, what, what would your delivery method, what are your plans for delivery method? That's so that's, a, good that's question. a great question, and, and we are actively working on that. We have um, an RNA therapeutics team. Um, we've developed our own processes for the synthesis, for the purification, for the validation of clinical grade RNA. So we can make clinical grade RNA now at our institute. And uh, as a matter of fact, we've been asked now by several companies to help them, small companies that are developing RNA vaccines against uh, SARS CoV 2. They've asked us to help them generate their, their RNA vaccines, and uh, we've made one of our own as well. So we're getting some experience in that. Um, and then um, RNA is not enough. You need some way to deliver it, as you're, as you're suggesting. And uh, we have uh, the fortune of having a nanomedicine department at our institute. So we have a group of scientists that um, this is what they do. They make lipid nanoparticles. They make uh, silica nanoparticles. They make different forms of carriers. And we are actively working with them, um, actively working with three labs in our nanomedicine group that have different approaches for delivery. And currently, we're, uh, we're thinking of uh, just using standard lipid nanoparticles uh, to deliver the RNA. Um, and the problem with that is uh, uh, they're well tolerated, and there's already some, 
some drugs that are available that use lipid nanoparticles. They're not very good at vascular targeting, however. So we're working on developing a vascular targeting techniques. And just published a paper in Circulation Research on that, on a leukosomal approach to delivery of uh, RNA or other agents to the vessel wall. Yeah, this is very, very exciting. Uh, it, it is the biggest challenge, how to deliver drugs where you want them to go. Um, almost all small molecules, uh, other than, you know, sort of, we don't really need to get through the blood-brain barrier in progeria so much, or, or you know, necessarily the eye, although it could probably do some good. Um, but small molecules often get to uh, most areas of the body, and sometimes you don't want them to. <laughs> um, but we hope that they get at least to the vasculature. But this is some of what causes side effects, right? When you're you're targeting things, and you know other things get targeted as well. What you're working on is much more specific, much more just to the point. Um, but you need to get into the vasculature. So it's a huge challenge, and I know you're up for it. And uh, you. You know, it's exciting. Your nanoparticles team is very, very exciting. It would be it would be wonderful to see that delivery into the vasculature and the heart in a big way. Thanks. We have another question. Um, someone asked, "Are there any preventive measures that a mother can take to reduce the risk?" There really isn't, uh, because this is what's like I call the sporadic autosomal dominant mutation. So um, mutations happen. Mutations happen in all of us. And sometimes they just change our hair color or our eye color a little bit. And sometimes on the other side of the pendulum that we end up um, having miscarriages. If, if uh, a mutation occurs at random that where the child isn't viable. Um, in progeria, we can see why the, the child is born, thankfully, because um, the cells that express progerin, for the most part, really don't um, differentiate. They're, they're the mature cells, and that, so they, they come a little bit later in development. Um, but really, what I tell parents is there's nothing you could have done differently. Now, if you have one child with progeria, you're going to want to get tested, and you're going to want to things are a little bit different. The rates are a little bit different. But just in sort of in general, parents didn't do anything wrong, and there's really nothing we can do to prevent progeria um, from that perspective. Thank you. Uh, another question, and I'll direct it to my junior colleague here, um, is the length of the telomere a permanent change? And I think what's being asked is, is the treatment. Does the treatment induce a permanent change in the length of the telomere, the telomerase treatment? Oh, uh, it's a very good question, actually. But um, the answer is no. It doesn't permanently uh, goes long. Like it go, it it gets longer. It extended, and then when cells divide again, it gets shorter. So mm -hmm. the therapy effect for some time, and then it goes back to the mm -hmm. normal, which is I would say is the is a good part of this mm -hmm. therapy because you don't want to induce any cancer. Um, mm. cancerous uh, property to mm. the cells. So, no, it's not permanent and it can reduce mm -hmm. after a couple of uh, division of the cells. Mm. Thanks. Um, you know, one thing that was really interesting, you didn't show it, uh, but I think uh, Dr. Gordon would find it interesting, is that there's an interaction somehow between progerin and the telomere. Because when you extended the telomere, you found that progerin levels went down in the human cells. Yeah, it is very interesting. We don't know why, but we're not fixing any mutation. But after telomerase therapy, we see that uh, there is a reduction of the progeny in both endothelial cells of the human endothelial cells and the mice model. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because we really did not fix any mutation. Mm -hmm. So either telomerase I, I, you know, we might have gotten a clue at, at uh, Dr. Gordon's meeting. I heard someone say that uh, inflammation or anti-inflammatories like uh, the IL-6 antagonist, because it reduces inflammation, inflammatory signaling, is also associated with a reduction in progerin. And, and uh, you've shown that the telomerase treatment reduces inflammatory, the expression of inflammatory genes. So maybe it's related to a normalization of inflammation and reactive oxygen species, something. What do you think, Dr. Gordon? 
Uh, you know, the IL-6 story is also fascinating because we can't really detect inflammatory cytokines uh, that are elevated in um, plasma in the blood, but there must be something at the micro level that plays a role. Mm -hmm. And so to connect things like the, the, the telomeres with the progerin and start to solve this, it could, it could certainly be all tied in. These are very important pathways to explore because once we understand them better, I think that's going to lead us to, to understand how to treat these kids better. Um, so I, I realize you don't know why the telomeres uh, and the progerin are connected, but exploring that is very, very important. I, I couldn't, I absolutely think um, there could be a clue with these sort of local inflammatory cytokines that the cell is healthier and, and that somehow connects. But I don't know how IL-6 actually connects with progerin either. So we've got a lot more research to do. <laughs> I think on that promising and hopeful note, I think we're coming to the end of our hour, and I do want to thank you, Dr. Gordon, for joining us. It was a spectacular presentation of wonderful work that you've done over the years. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Well, thank great. you both for joining us at the thank cutting you. edge of cardiovascular sciences. Thanks.